welcome back for the last section. I'm Sharon Hecker, uh, the Deputy Chair of ICRA. And uh, this panel uh, is dedicated to rethinking the role of paper in an artist's legacy. So we really wanted to follow up on the previous panel, which talked about radical ways of using paper, to uh, focus on artists who we might not associate with paper, who also did other things, and uh, how paper figured in their, uh, their thinking, their practice, their legacy. We have an amazing lineup of um, experts. Uh, we have first, we have Adam Greenhouse, who is the lead author of the Catalogue Raisonné of Mark Roth Rothko, the works on paper, and he's an associate curator at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. We have uh, Kira Kufud, who is the head of archives at the Torvaldsen Museum. And we have Sewan Kang, who is an archivist at the Easton Foundation, the Louise Bourgeois Archive, and a cataloger of the Louise Bourgeois Complete Prints and Books. And the panel will be moderated by Andrea Rose, who's an art historian and editor of Leon Kossoff, Catalogue Raisonné of the Oiled Paintings. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for staying to the end of this um, very, very long and informative um, afternoon, and I hope we'll add and contribute to that. I, I want to start with apologies, actually, and that's to Fabian. I don't know if she's still here, um, because I'm going to set her a little task. When Kenneth Clark was a young director of the National Gallery, he bought a sketchbook by Cézanne and tore out all the sheets and gave as Christmas presents to friends and protégés each a drawing. So, Fabian, if you're here, you've got those to, uh, to look for. The question is, does that actually say that drawings are secondary and of less value? You'll know that the National Gallery does not show drawings at all, for example. Um, or does it say something about the generosity of, of, of Kenneth Clark? One of, the, one of the questions I want to put to our very distinguished panel is... Um, the status of drawings, the hierarchy, which we've talked about earlier on. Um, because Louis Bourgeois, which C1 is going to talk about, said there's no rivalry. They all say the same thing in different ways. Of the many, many different media that she used in interrelated ways, in ways that would be extremely difficult to deconstruct if one's looking at posters, prints, fabric works, and, and so on. Um, so... And in the case of Rothko, which Adam is going to talk about, um, many of what we regard as paintings, which, or multi-form paintings, known as they're known for the latter part of his life, are actually made as drawings, the larger, or, or on paper, then on, laid on bigger supports. Um, whether that was because of his physical frailty at that stage, although they were very large, I don't know, but I'm sure Adam is going to tell us. Um, we have three very, very different approaches, three very, very different artists. Kira's going to talk about Torvaldsen, the leading neoclassical sculptor of the period, a sculptor amongst a catalogue raisonné dedicated to on paper. So she's going to look at whether drawings should be catalogued as associative things. Do you have a separate catalogue for drawings? Are these drawings only seen or valued in relation to, uh, to sculpture. And I, I want to pose a question to her, because looking at her catalogue resume, I saw that a carving or a sculpture by Torvaldsen, um, classified as one of his, is carved, carved posthumously. So I think sculptures could be seen in the same way as multiples or reproductions of works, and the question of their status in relation to what could be an original work, which might only have been in plaster, uh, possibly not if you're carving directly, um, is another question for um, a catalogue author. Um, many of you here are catalogue authors, and I'm going, hopefully, to open to you as much as possible so you can ask our distinguished panel about the decisions you have to make as a researcher and a so-called leading authority. One of the questions I want to humbly position, pose to you is, are we leading authorities, though we may be the authors of Catalogue Resonate? And I have a particular example. Um, I was recently asked by an auction house to look at a very large torn drawing by Leon Kossoff. 
Um, one recommendation I make to all of you is try to work with living artists. It's so much easier if you can actually go to the artist and say, did you do this? Um, in the case of Kosov, who had uh, told me, no, I tore it up because I didn't want it to exist anymore, but then dumped it in a skip, as was his wont, outside his studio. Subsequently, somebody came along and removed it from the skip, glued it together, and I said to the auction house, no, this is not an authentic work. The consigner then spoke to me and said, it was done by him, it's therefore authentic. Think of the National Gallery, Manet's Maxim execution of Maximilian is put together from different panels which, but have been torn and destroyed. So questions of authenticity are not always, um, well, they might not be, we can make them, but they can always be challenged. Um, we have two American artists uh, to discuss and one European, so I... I would like to look at whether there are distinctions between a European approach and an American approach. Of course, all three artists were Europeans. They were all born in Europe, two emigrated to America. And the one who remained in Europe, uh, Torvaldson, actually is probably the only one who has um, a self-portrait sculpture in Central Park on 96 Transverse, if you are uh, minded to, to visit it there, so that he has an honorary status in America anyway, together with Hans Christian Andersen, the only Great Dane, I think, that America recognizes. <laughs> um, all three of our speakers are actually represent, representing artists whose estates are held within museums. That poses very different questions from those of us, in my case, who represent an estate very often with family members and other uh, experts and specialists on their board. And I would like to know from them some of the financial implications, some of the relationships to family. We've heard how in the case of Matisse, there have been objections to showing certain works and how you negotiate that from within a museum. Um, But I think that's all I'm going to say and pass over to my panel. I'm going to start with Kira, because I think we'll do this chronologically. We'll start with the neoclassical. We'll move on to multi-form in the, in the form of Rothko. And then we'll move to anti-form in the case of Louise Bourgeois. So, Kira, over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me. It's a very special thing to be here today. I'm very grateful and it's very inspiring also. Torvaldsen's Museum in Copenhagen. I don't know how many of you have been there. But it was erected as the first public museum in, in Denmark, 1839 to 1847, to house and display the artworks and collections of the Danish neoclassical sculptor Bertel Torvaldsen, who lived and worked more than half of his life in Rome. The whole collection was a gift from the sculptor himself to his native city of Copenhagen to ensure free and equal access to art and cultural heritage to the citizens of Denmark during the period of absolutistic reign of the Danish kings. In 1849, five years after Thorvaldsen died, and one year after the museum opened, Denmark had its first free constitution. Our online catalog currently holds 18,093 artworks from antiquity to Torvaldsen's own time. Torvaldsen's private collections of books and coins are still to be included. Torvaldsen's drawings sums up to 1,445, including the few that are catalogued but uh, situated outside Torvaldsen's museum. And it's still not done, the work with this. As something quite unique, we also have Torvaldsen's private and work-related let letter archives, handwritten in several languages, many with Gothic letters and otherwise difficult to read to a modern public. In the years up to and following Torvaldsen's death in 1844, many efforts were made to polish the story of the national icon, including his taste in art, and for many years the museum held guard over the material that were not meant to be studied by others. His drawings were for many years stored away and not as accessible to the public. 
and some of them were even destroyed. Torvaldsen's reliefs and the sculptures and his collections of especially paintings were the focus of the museum. Since 2004, though, we have been working intensively on making both the main part of our collections and our letter archives accessible online. Today, everybody can search, find, read, and hopefully understand more. The most important of the letters in Danish can also be read in English translations, like this letter from Torvaldsen to his father. As I mentioned, our museum is lucky to hold both the artworks and the private collections of a single artist and his letter archives and workshop accounts that tells us about the creation and reception of the artworks, of Torvaldsen's network, his workshop practice, way of collecting, etc. Thus, we decided to interweave the two collections and archival material digitally and to try to overcome the former hierarchies that had raised some items above others and made it difficult to understand and study relations between them. So in 2021, we launched our new online catalog, which substitutes an older one, and which now holds and not only, not only holds the artworks in our collections, but also functions, or are supposed to, within due time, to function as a catalog resume of Torvaldsen's artworks worldwide. The catalog and the Torvaldsen's museum archives are now interlinked, so artworks mentioned in the letters are shown in the archives, and primary sources and other literature are listed in the online catalog. In these slides, you can see the entry of one of the artwork. In reality, it's listed more neatly and with options to see or not to see further information. All the red dots on the right means that the sources can be studied in the archives and a single click will take you there. As you can see, we also try to visualize both Torvaldsen's workshop practice and later reuse of representations of his works of art in the category related artworks. And this is a very important way also of highlighting his drawings to make them more visible to the public. In regard to Torvaldsen's drawings, they're not very often mentioned in letters though, and never in his accounts. He did some drawings as presents, and these are often mentioned, but most of his drawings were sketches for his reliefs and sculptures and were not regarded as anything more than a simple working stage, leased by Torvaldsen himself. Some drawings are made on the same pieces of paper as drafts and letters, and are thus published both in the catalogue and in the letter archives. The linking between the two sites makes it possible to discover, study, and get explanation for both categories. And then the following three slides shows the original hierarchy due to the capital letters used to categorize the collections at our museum, and some of the speakers today has touched upon this before. A, the first letter, is Torvaldsen's sculptures and reliefs. B, is his collection of paintings and then come C, his drawings. M is his private library. And with this new flat order that we try to establish in, on, in our online catalog, we have tried to make everything equally accessible, but at the same time keeping the possible possibility of sorting by categories, technique, date, motives, etc. And as you can see here, we have used terms and structures that matches our own collections, but also the Getty standards and the Danish national standards. So to sum up, we hope and believe to have created a useful tool for collecting and holding information and showing publicly both our archives and our artworks and the connection between them. We can now display the stored, the formally hidden, the fragile, the lost, the uncertain, and the formally cut out. We have a wonderful tool for working with our collections in new and more structured ways. The data is structured in a non-hierarchical manner, and it's easy to find also just by Google search. This spread spreads out its democratic potential a lot, 
we can see that from people writing to us that didn't know we existed before. Everybody can now sort and search and find information, obtain overviews and discover formerly hidden connections. And we have created a solid and fruitful base for renewed Torvaldsen studies nationally as well as internationally. The platforms function as generators of new relevant narratives and enables everybody to get close to a long gone but still highly relevant era. It is so extremely costly, time consuming and almost endless. I've been working at the museum since 2006 and we are about one quarter of the material that we have been studying thoroughly. It's, it takes a lot of work to do the data separation of text, make new photos, establish connections between artworks and documents, keeping facts up to date, and including formerly analog data. And there's a threat also of drowning our, our audience in the massive amount of information. So we will have to continue also to structure it, to create parts of it to also reach the audience that are not used to work with this kind of material or this period of time. Doing all this, though, has been a great experience. We seem to end in circle, or maybe rather take another round in the spiral that started with the Enlightenment, was fueled by the ideas of the French Revolution, and lived out by artists and intellectuals like Thorvaldsen. That meant that one of the ways to be a good citizen, or a good institution for us, working for the common good, was to set people free to do their best, and to have free and equal access both to education as well as art and knowledge from our common cultural heritage. In this way, the peak hole back in time that our museum in many ways uh, is, is also our generator to focus on today's challenges of weakened democracies and the spreading of misinformation. So we believe that our struggle are in line with the DNA of the museum and of the ideas of Torvalds in this time. Art, education and knowledge are for everybody and should be set free for everybody to study and enjoy. Preferable without strict set hierarchies. Thank you so much for your time. Adam, should we go straight on? Sure. Okay. All right. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure and a privilege to present to such a knowledgeable audience. All right. Following a lengthy legal battle in the 1970s, Mark Rothko's estate was divided between his children, Kate and Christopher, and the Mark Rothko Foundation. In 1985, the foundation distributed its holdings of more than 1,200 works to 35 museums worldwide and then dissolved. The National Gallery of Art in Washington received the majority, over a thousand works on canvas, panel, and paper. We have the largest public collection of Rothko's work. The foundation's intent was for the gallery to serve in loco parentis. In accepting the gift, the gallery agreed to keep works on display, make loans widely available, and publish a catalogue raisonné. In 1998, the catalogue raisonné of Rothko's works on canvas by David Anfam was published. At that point, research began on the works on paper. I took over in 2015. Yes, it's been a while, uh, and it's a tough, it's a tough job. Uh, poor me, I have to go to people's houses and look at uh, Rothko. I'm not complaining, but, th but these things take time, don't they? Um, the catalog was originally envisioned as a print publication, just some more shots of my difficult existence. <laughs> uh, the catalog was originally envisioned as a print publication. Shortly after I joined the project, though, we decided to publish online in phases with print volumes to follow eventually. In 2019, we launched our online resource at rothco.nga.gov. We're not calling it a catalog raisonné yet while it's still being developed and updated. The site is currently populated with uh, 1,930 works, so just about 700 to go. Uh, give, it, give, it a, give it a test drive, please visit. Um, hope you like it, but it is a work in progress. 
be warned. The benefits of a digital product are numerous, it seems to me. The flexibility of a powerful relational database allows users to sort and filter in numerous ways. Here, works from the 1940s, single-sided only, in watercolor or ink on watercolor paper, works that have been exhibited and published. Every work has a dedicated object page with full hyperlinked provenance, exhibition history and bibliography. We have high-res zoomable images. Our IIIF viewer allows comparison of many images if you desire. We have infinite space for commentary with zoomable, zoomable comparative figs. Um, we have installation photographs uh, of exhibitions and the capacity to juxtapose works on paper and related canvases. Works can be linked to reveal iconographic or stylistic uh, rhymes or themes. Sketchbooks can be virtually flipped through, tracing sequences and juxtapositions. Structured data, tags, and hyperlinks can reveal connections that might otherwise remain invisible. I'd like to think that the site can function as an interactive tool that encourages exploration far beyond that, capable with a static printed volume, and hopefully beyond even what I might imagine. Rothko's cats, for example. Mm -hmm. Flexibility is the name of the game. Whoops. The works on paper catalog raisonne will, if nothing else, reveal a little known and understudied side of Rothko's output. Rothko is, of course, rightly celebrated for his towering abstract paintings on canvas. Everyone is swooning over them in Paris, even as we speak. They're great, for sure. You'll get no argument from me. Lesser known, though, are his works on paper, of which he made about 2,650. Over half are small graphite or ink drawings, sketches, and preparatory studies. Drawing was a regular activity for Rothko, as was, it would seem, drawing other people drawing. But it was a private activity. His drawings were personal, not intended for exhibition or sale. And he pretty much abandoned it in the early 1940s, only returning to it on rare occasions later in magnificent little things like this. On the other hand, he painted on paper for the entirety of his career, making about a 1,000 paintings on paper. What do I mean by paintings on paper? It's an odd hybrid term, I admit. And what does it matter anyway? Well, labels matter, and I think the term accurately describes an important subset of Rothko's uh, works on paper. My exhibition, Mark Rothko, Paintings on Paper, which just opened in Washington, addresses the matter. Sorry for the shameless plug. Mm. Come visit. It'll be open until March 31st, and buy the book. In an attempt to uh, sidestep the slipperiness of contested definitions, I sought guidance from Rothko himself, who, characteristically unhelpful, had nothing explicit to say on the topic. But in late 1968, about two years before his death, he undertook an inventory of all of his works on art still in his possession, recording information about more than 800 in what he titled the Rothko Painting Catalog. That should be circling Rothko Painting Catalog. <laughs> not the blank space to the right of Rothko painting catalog. Each documented work was assigned an inventory number and was photographed. Here, a photograph of a 1968 painting on paper and the relevant painting catalog page. All right. Rothko was not in good health. In early 1968, he had suffered a near-fatal aortic aneurysm. He'd recently written his will, established his foundation, made sales, and signed contracts with his dealer. He appears to have been getting his affairs in order. The inventory seems to have been intended to identify works for immediate sale by his dealer or posthumous sale by his foundation to fund its charitable work. I'm showing you here photos of works on paper from the inventory. Importantly, the painting catalog does not document every work in Rothko's possession. It includes about 400 canvases and about 400 works on paper, all made with watercolor, oil, acrylic, or ink applied with a brush. Some statistics for context. About 1,600 loose works on paper in all media, plus several sketchbooks, were in Rothko's possession at this point. 900 of those were made with a brush and watercolor, oil, or acrylic. Less than half of those were included in the painting catalog. In selecting works to include, Rothko did not divide by medium or support. Rather, he appears to have distinguished works by function or status, private versus public. More than a practical and tedious accounting, the inventory entailed a reckoning. Rothko was deciding, I think, what he wanted to allow to go out into the world and what he wanted to keep private. In a sense, he was curating his legacy. 
This focus on public versus private is relevant because Rothko was extremely careful, controlling even, about how his works were displayed and to whom they were sold. He wrote about this in 1947, and I quote, a picture lives by companionship, expanding and quickening in the eyes of the sensitive observer. It dies by the same token. It is therefore a risky and unfeeling act to send it out into the world. So the inventory, in a way, was Rothko's chance to review and vet what he was willing to risk send out, sending out into the world in the eventuality of his death. Rothko's risk analysis is fundamental to an understanding of the meaning and function of the various subsets of his works on paper and their relationships to his canvases. It guided my thinking about the exhibition. If it's a risk to send pictures out into the world, the question for me became which works on paper did Rothko think were worth the risk and why? For the exhibition, we've chosen works on paper that were exhibited or sold or given as gifts during his lifetime or those vetted during the inventory by inclusion in the painting catalog. Rothko's engagement with paper ebbed and flowed. Four particularly fruitful periods reveal the role paper played in his success and the establishment of his reputation as one of the preeminent artists of the 20th century. Little known figurative subjects from the mid 1930s reveal early artistic aspirations and influences. Notably, his first solo exhibition in 1933 included only works on paper. This is what he was showing and trying to sell, mostly without success, it should be said. Symbolic works of the mid 40s with stratified compositions and luminous translucent washes anticipate the move to abstraction. He would translate the thin applications of his watercolor technique to glazes of oil paint on canvas in the multiforms of the late 1940s and the classic format works of the 1950s. In 1946, Betty Parsons organized a solo show of Rothko's watercolors that traveled from New York to California. Nearly all of the works on view sold quickly. It was arguably Rothko's first real financial success, a breakthrough. Rothko's high esteem for these works is demonstrated in his 1961 retrospective at MoMA, which he opened with this quartet of mid-40s watercolors. About 60 oil paintings on paper made in 1958 and 1959 appear to have provided respite and fresh inspiration after a taxing period of work on canvas in the form of the ultimately frustrating Seagram Mural Commission. That Rothko operated on such radically different scales complicates our understanding of size in his work, in particular his statements that he paints large in order to be intimate and human. Bigger is not necessarily better. Rothko intended paintings on paper made after 1949 to be mounted rather than framed. The unconventional preference lends them the appearance, presence, and quite radically, the status of his canvases. These are paintings. Vibrant paintings on paper made in the final years of the 60s complicate long-standing associations between Rothko's darkening palette on canvas and his declining physical and mental health. In 1968, he made 120 paintings on paper and three canvases, his most prolific year to that point. And in 1969, he made another 120 at least. Rather than diminishing or retreating, in his late works on paper, amplification is the name of the game. In the energy and force of the paint handling and in the immediacy, intensity, and potency of the colors and in size. They range from four and a half to seven feet tall. The largest are on par with the dimensions of many of his abstract canvases made after 1949. Bigger is not better, of course, but Rothko's paintings on paper, I think, upset a categorical and hierarchical convention in our field that nobody here subscribes to, I'm sure. Namely, that is, that paintings are on canvas and drawings are on paper. And by extension, paintings, canvas, are big and major, and drawings, paper, are small and minor. For Rothko, painting was painting, whether on canvas or paper, and his work, I would suggest, does not necessarily fit easily within conventional divisions of an artist's oeuvre based on medium or support. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you on speaking one minute, but I'm sure you have many questions for um, Adam in a minute. I just want to ask you, Adam, now, um, if there's no distinction between the late works where paper is laid on a support and they're called paintings, 
are you, as the author of a catalogue raisonné of Rothko's works on paper, including these, and distinguishing them from the catalogue that David Anfran did with works which are regarded as paintings? Yeah, so the... Good question. Complicated stuff. So the decision to divide the catalogue raisonné into two volumes was made in the 90s. Uh, the first one being works on canvas. So they're not actually divided by painting or drawing. It's canvas and now paper. Mm. Obviously, canvas came first. David Anfam did it. So there is like a prioritization of canvas. Um, now I'm just in charge of anything on paper. So I have no choice but put, to, to put these in the, the, the catalog raisonné of the works on paper. What I would, and maybe we can talk about this more later, like ideally in a dream scenario, everything would be in our in our online resource, online catalog raisonné together. Yeah. Everything with its own object page, so everything can be uh, hyperlinked and related, and you can understand them as a, as a full, like, complete um, body of work. There are challenges in that, in that ANFAM's catalog raisonné of canvases would have to be updated. It's, you know, it hasn't been updated since 1998. Um, You're not up for that? <laughs> I am up for it. Hypothetically, I would like to do something else in my life than work on <laughs> Mark Rothko, or, or although there, there are worse things that one could ask for. Um, certain instit and I don't want, I don't want to get, get ahead of ourselves in the conversation here, but certain um, people, institutional forces don't want to take that on for various reasons, legal, financial, etc. But I think it makes sense. I think, uh, like, rationally, intellectually, in terms of scholarship, it makes complete sense. Mm. Um, the problem with, uh, again, I'm getting, I think I'm getting ahead of uh, myself here, but I think, uh, you know, as soon as you print something on paper, it becomes instantly obsolete. So w when we eventually produce print volumes of the works on paper, it's, you know, instantly obsolete. We can't add to it. So there's the flexibility and the, the, you know, the future sustainability of the of possibilities of, the, of an online thing or a digital thing versus the physical um, but immediately obsolete um, aspect of the, of the printed volume. Within, the, within, within our online resource, what I want to do next is figure out some way to um, distinguish between what I'm calling paintings on paper, by which I mean the public-facing works on paper, uh, as Rothko understood them, and the private things, the drawings and the things that he didn't include in the, in the inventory, in the catalog, um, within the body of the works on paper, whether it's some sort of distinction within what we call an inventory number or um, an estate number or some other way of, just, of actually making it clear which ones he um, vetted for, for public... Um, sale or display after his death, or that were shown during his lifetime. But that's something that we can do easily by just uh, reconfiguring the, the software. Yeah. I do hope somebody here is going to question that the published printed volume is immediately obsolete. Catherine, I know you're about to publish the catalogue resume of Lucian Freud, and I hope that is certainly not the case. But we can take that up with Adam <laughs> later. See one. Thank you. Provocative. <laughs> Thank you all for inviting me here to speak. I'm very honored. Um, my name is Sewan Kang, and I'm archivist at the Easton Foundation and Louise Bourgeois Archive, which is housed in the townhouse directly next to Bourgeois. It was a very lucky uh, real estate opportunity to buy the exact same house <laughs> next door. Um, we've basically, we've kept her home as she left it um, when she passed, and although we're not, not quite at the level of Cure's institution, making tours very public, um, we do have people um, in by appointment, and I think a few people here have been. Um, and uh, we are the stewards of all of her diaries, her papers, her many, many papers, and her small collection of prints and books. Born in 1911 in Paris, uh, Bourgeois died in 2010 in New York, and she's, of course, best known for her monumental sculptures. This is Maman outside of the Tate, um, and this measures about nine meters. And yes, I did do the conversion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, this is um, a kind of smaller spider at the Hayward Gallery in 2022. And um, 
I also have to mention her series of cells, which are these architectural environments that she debuted in the 1993 Venice Biennial. And um, the series would go on until the end of her life um, and you know, number it at the total of 60. Um, and these really are like the inside of Bourgeois' house, which is why we share it with people and think it's meaningful for people to see how she lived and how there was no separation between her work and her life. But today we're here to talk about her works on paper, particularly her prints. This is the homepage of the online catalog Resine. It was published by MoMA and funded by the Easton Foundation. So um, I worked at the MoMA for about six years under the auspices of the foundation where I now work to catalog about uh, 1,500 original compositions over um, 5,400 individual sheets because she worked very iteratively and she would pull proofs of states um, that evolved into the final composition and she donated all of those state proofs to MoMA's collection so you can literally see how the composition um, evolves over time, which is unique to prints. Um, with a sculpture, you see the final and that's about it. Um, we've organized everything according to theme. Um, as Kira mentioned, you, you know, you're at the risk of drowning your audience in too much information. So with 1,500 compositions, we thought, okay, these are the key themes that you might be interested in. Um, we've also uh, organized it by technique. So if you only wanna know about engravings, etchings, et cetera. Um, also by printer and publisher, as well as format, a book, um, a series. This is an example of a single object view. This is a print called Do Not Abandon Me, which she printed on a piece of fabric that you know, she had saved for many decades. Um, and this is something she started to do in the mid 90s, early 2000s, use fabric as a printing surface. Um, and if you scroll down, you can see what we call the evolving composition diagram. The source in this case is a sculpture um, and as you see, as you, you know, move left to right down <coughs> these rectangles, these are the, the, the states, and um, they're divided by a little gray line, which I hope you can see, um, to indicate that the next state has been reached. Um, but in other cases, she would make prints of a drawing from decades earlier, or just you know, a drawing that she had made that morning, or start with the print entirely. Um, and we have the ability to compare as well, so this is state one compared to the final state. Um, we also have related works in the catalog and related works in other mediums, again, because she made so many works uh, just to help people sort of orient themselves um, and to see you know, how she used the mediums uh, interchangeably. Uh, printmaking was always a really integral part of Bourgeois' career. Um, when she first came to the U.S. in 1938, she almost immediately went to the Art Students League to sign up for life drawing classes and printmaking classes um, just to get situated as a new, you know, new person in the city. Um, this is uh, the illustrated book, He Disappeared Into Complete Silence, which is one of her most important works. Um, and she developed it at Atelier 17, which was Stanley William Hayter's um, print shop that he briefly ran in New York during World War II. Um, and here you can see that she was playing around with the very avant-garde techniques that he promoted, um, the very bright white areas of the plate. Um, oh, I don't think this clicks. Oh, it does. Um, here and here are um, where the plate, sorry. <laughs> uh, the plate was actually gouged to create this sort of embossing effect. Um, and you'll notice this is quite small. It's like eight centimeters tall, the plate. Um, and this is something that she could do from home. She was a mother to three young children and she could you know, engrave at the dinner table. Eventually she did buy herself a small printing press and she tried to edition this book on this press herself, but it wasn't a commercial success. And so she abandoned that edition and eventually completed it many years later. This is an example um, from toward the end of her career. Uh, when she finds herself in a very different circumstance. She's financially successful. Um, she's regarded as a major artist. Um, and so printmaking played a role during that era too, not when she was just this young mom trying to 
run the household and keep things going. Um, this is about 1.5 meters tall, um, so taller than the artist herself. Um, a print publisher would bring these plates prepared with soft ground etching to her home um, so she could do the plates um, you know, comfortably in her native habitat, <laughs> and then they would uh, publish the prints, you know, edition the prints elsewhere. Um, but soft ground etching, as you know, is a very easy medium. Um, for the artist, you don't have to dig into the plate because the acid will do the work of digging into the plate for you. So all she had to do was put down a piece of tracing paper and then move her pencil around just as if she was doing it on drawing on paper and then um, that would be lifted up and the, the plate would be etched in the, in the print shop. She would then have them bring the, the printed work back and add very you know, different hand editions for each one. Um, and so this was a challenge because she would um, sometimes only print like an eighth of the print, uh, an eighth of the plate, such that you can hardly see the image underneath. So we're looking at this thing that's overpainted and has so many hand editions and saying, like, I know there's a print in there, but I just can't see it right now. Um, but we, we decided to go ahead and organize it by plate um, because that was the only thing that really made sense in, in this print catalog resume. Um, she would then go on to make these sort of multi-panel, room-sized you know, installations almost um, by combining the large five-foot prints with many hand editions and um, handwritten text. So this is a piece called I Give Everything Away, made in the year of her death, and it's a very poignant, um, impactful piece. She's talking about packing her bags and leaving, um, and, and then she would pass um, the same year. So um, she took paper to, you know, as Adam was saying with Rothko, unexpected places, and I think, you know, uh, achieved like a high impact through paper, as high an impact as one might receive through her sculpture. Thank you. Oh, shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> we have three exhibitions kind of all over the world, so please, and, and please reach out. Thank you very much, Siwon. Um, I want to take a line that Kira gave us. Um, costly, timeless, almost endless when doing a catalogue resonate. Of course, most of you here will have done exhibitions and you all know it's a bit of a sprint as you get to the final date of the opening. Publishers are waiting to go. A catalogue resonate is not that. It's a slog and a marathon and you have to be prepared for it. But you also have to be prepared as a result for the cost. So I want to ask you the uh, rather vulgar question about um, the institutional costs of having this endless task. Um, are you, you, you see one say the Eastman Foundation, are they still funding? And how much does the museum, MoMA, for example, still have to contribute towards a couple of, for, for many people who are working with artists who do not have museums mm -hmm. uh, behind them, which probably the majority, mm -hmm. um, how does your experience fit with that? Yes, the Easton Foundation generously supported the catalog resume for 10 years. Um, the MoMA was the publisher, and you know that's where we worked. We worked with their collection. Um, at some point, the upkeep of, I mean, everyone thinks an online catalog resume is great, and it, and it it is because you can keep updating it, but technology ages too. <laughs> so at some point, um, MoMA, you know, their digital media uh, prior priorities change such that um, the upkeep of our website wasn't the number one priority anymore. And so we did something called like freezing it in time such that it is, you know, a snapshot of when we completed it in 2018. And we do have an addendum linked to it if we find prints otherwise. Um, but I think, you know, if money's not a problem, um, which in our case, luckily it isn't, um, there are, you know, institutional challenges like Adam alluded to um, that make it so that uh, the support you need is, is, is changing. It's maybe not what you hoped, um, but uh, it, managing a big institution, I mean, it's not it's like for managing your family, isn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> one of the questions we haven't raised is everybody is very in favor of online because, of course, it reaches a huge audience. And uh, Kira, you were saying 
earlier that um, you've reached people who hadn't really heard of Torbos mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. so they came across your website. But presumably there, there are annual licensing costs for every uh, use, of the, use of the technology, which for many foundations would be prohibitive. I, I'm, I'm not again, I'm rather pro-books for that reason, but um, do you have those problems? Um, no, because Mom was said we should freeze it in time. And so, um, you know, when we update it, we update it in a way that doesn't, it's not like a live website anymore. Okay. And Kira, how about you? We have a certain sum every year that the museum has to pay, um, which is quite a lot. Are it's you for hosting. By the Danish state? Is the museum totally When we developed the catalogue and the online archives, we were funded by private Danish foundations oh, yeah. through 16 years. And we have three to four people, art historians, sitting there every day doing um, the work. That, um, is that an ongoing? No, then unfortunately the same foundations had to be used for applying for other projects for the museum. So the project of continuing this work was shut down at least for a period of time. So now it's only me left and some students then ha that has to do other things. So as are well. you and C1 both sort of held in a, a frozen position in terms of what you can add at the moment because of cost? I can add as much as I have the time to add, and the yes. students have the time to add. We try to, to integrate updating the catalogue and the archives with the jobs that we have to do otherwise. But as everyone can figure out, it's not the same uh, speed that we can work with, mm -hmm. not at all. But you try, whenever we have some, some time left over, we, I, I tend to seek into the archives and the catalogue to What's do the job. What's unique to you? You have to publish in multiple, or you, are, you do publish in multiple languages. You, Adam and C1, presumably uh, imperialist America doesn't feel it need to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we actually translate all of her French inscriptions into English for you, so mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we're doing people a service. <laughs> Adam, how does that work with um, the National Gallery? The funding situation? Um, so f the software, first of all, we use an open source software, Collective Access. We looked at a lot of different um, platforms, and there was zero appetite institutionally to build something ourselves or pay for something like bespoke, knowing that it would break or be obsolete immediately. So we went with, a, we went with an open source software that we had configured to our specifications. We pay um, a small amount to host it every year, like $2,000 or something. And we pay um, when work needs to be done. If I want some new configuration or if I want to put a, do a giant batch data upload or something, they do that for us on a like hourly fee, whatever. Um, so in theory, it's sustainable, but we will have to continue to pay that hosting um, fee forever if we want to mm -hmm. keep it going. Um, we, so yeah, we pay. Does the, the, the foundation pay for No, well, the, the found, so there is no found, the foundation oh, doesn't given, no longer exist. Dissolved. Yeah, so we act like the foundation, but the family is very involved in making sure that we, the National Gallery, um, live up to our commitment. So, you know, this work on the, on the works on paper catalog raising a started in 1998 under the supervision of my predecessor, Ruth Fine, and which is many, many years ago. And um, the family are not super happy that it's taken so long. And my, uh, the National Gallery's treasurer is also not super happy that it's taken so long. So there's a lot of pressure to finish, um, but uh, these, these things take time. I think part of the idea of producing print volumes at the end will be to, you know, because they'll sell like hotcakes. To, to, you know, it's going to be 2,000 pages of, of drawings, um, and that will somehow recoup um, some of the expenditure. Um, what I always like to say to my treasurer when he's breathing down my neck um, is that we received a gift of 1,000 works by Mark Rothko, which if you were to try to you know, come up with some, you know, market value for those, it would be in the billions. So, you know, and it's a great resource for the world and the nation. All of these things are in, in public access and you can come and see them in, in real life whenever you want. So balancing that, <laughs> um, 
Treasurers are usually rather hard. Oh, they don't. Uh, hard, no, no. hard-hearted with those arguments. He <laughs> says, "Look, you you yeah, spent, not selling any. You spent fifty thousand dollars on travel this year. I don't care." So yeah, it's it's a it's a cost, and um, we continue to pay it because we're committed to to you know living up to the agreement that we made. Um, yeah, the end. Can, can I? Did I say too much? Can, can I ask no. each of you one question, and then I'm going to open it to the audience? What have you individually learned by doing a catalogue, isn't it, about the artists that you didn't know before? Because I, I mean, I just well, I'm going to put the question to you, Kira. I mean, I've learned that it has been up before today that an artist can draw in very, very many various ways, depending on the function of the work and the function of the piece of paper he's holding. So the variety of ways of expressing himself, and sometimes it's connected to a sculpture that he has to make or a relief, but not always. And to seeing how different all these pieces of paper are is very interesting. Also to be more modest in regard to think that you know an artist because it's so yes. individual. Adam, you've shown us cats. Um, what did you learn about Mark Rothko that you didn't know before? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know anything about his work on paper. I don't think, I don't think many people do. Um, you know, we did the last, so there's this big exhibition in Paris at the moment of the, of the, of the canvases, and we have this exhibition of the paintings on paper. The previous sort of like really big retrospective was in 1998, organized at the gallery, traveled around. And th it did include some works on paper, some watercolors from the 40s, and then some of the late sort of larger paintings on paper. And even then, with you know, very, very intelligent curators at the gallery and David Anfam working on the catalog raisonne of canvases at the National Gallery, Nobody had any idea what the, what the sort of function of those things were. It was in the, in the wall text on the, on the, in the exhibition that these, it was unknown whether these were studies for canvases or what. So like, basically everything that I have learned um, working on this catalogue raisonne is, is new to me, obviously, and I think it's new to a, to a lot of people, even people who have worked on Rothko for, for many, many years. It's completely, um, you know, it's completely revelatory. I just wondered whether the relationship between the early work, there seems to be a, a general perception that M Rothko is known largely for these stained, very large works, but does, r rather like the Philip Guston show currently at Tate Modern, if any of you have not seen it, it's well worth going to, um, the early work, which is generally regarded as not even preparatory, but a different artist, it's so untrue, even yeah. through the abstract works. And I wondered if you felt, looking at those much earlier works, which are in a different... <laughs> Sorry formal vein. Interrupt, but we have to. We have oh, to sorry. That's questions because the building will close. I'm sorry. I hadn't realised we were. <laughs> it's we were such going a on. great panel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't think I've even given you any time to to ask a question. So, would you thank my <laughs> panel members? <laughs>